And I think it's recording now, although we didn't hear the the, the usual uh, female voice uh, that says that it's recording, but uh, welcome, Mas Hoymark. Thank you. Uh, it's great to, to have this conversation about you because uh, while we share the same deep interest for what we could call um, generically philosophical health, right? How do people get um, a more coherent and and more, uh, you know, uh, have a, a better sense of the possible and sense of purpose through uh, philosophizing? You have this particular attachment to something that I've always felt important, um, although I'm not like you, a specialist, which is uh, mythos, the myth uh, in all its aspects. Um, so am I right in saying that you see life as an epic? You could say so, perhaps, yeah. I think so, and it's... um. I think I've come to the conclusion that I cannot not think mythically to some extent. And it has been a both a passion and a frustration actually for many years that I had these, or so it would seem, these two poles that I tried to navigate in between. It would be uh, logos and mythos or philosophy and mythology. And they never seem to be quite the same. Sometimes they approach each other, sometimes they're way apart. And, and I had trouble to uh, separate them from each other um, until I found out that maybe that wasn't my project. Maybe the project was living in this pole voltage space between mythos and logos. Right, yeah, and, and that's interesting because very often people think that embracing a purpose in life is something that you choose like you go to the supermarket and you say okay oh this is cool yeah the environment it's trending uh but no it's something that is uh calling you it's it's deeply uh, intertwined with with your own um person or perhaps or would you say soul perhaps yes and it's um it's interesting like last year about a year ago now, we had a conference on a philosophical practice in Copenhagen. And a professor from Denmark, who's actually one of the founders of the Danish Society for Philosophical Practice, said to me, um, it, was, it was in a small pause, he said, it's interesting that you have thrown yourself upon this uh, mytho-philosophical thing. And, and I said to him, I, I actually feel it's like the other way around, that it's thrown itself upon me. Right. Um, so, so I definitely get what you're saying. It's not mm -hmm. necessarily something that we choose. It's something that that is there for us um, and we try to discover. Right. At the same time, there is something very interesting um, at a um, meta level in what we are saying now, which is the following. Uh, we all have our moments where we... We get in touch with the epic or mythic dimension of life, right? For example, I often have that when I go to a, a forest in in Sweden. Mm. Uh, the, it, for me, it's those trees are are whispering uh, beautiful uh, tales and and grandiose um, narratives, and yet not all of us embrace that worldview fully. And that's the case for all types of worldviews. So I think there are two things here. One is the intellectual curiosity, poetic curiosity that one might have for different worldviews, right? And the other is the embracing of a concept. Uh, so what makes it important to, to embrace one will view, and I understood that you didn't really choose it, but you could choose to be a dilettante rather than wow. have that as your perspective, right? Yes. So what makes it important? So I think it's some, um, so sometimes when you when you talk about like philosophical practice or uh, lived philosophy, living philosophy, it's uh, 
it's something that takes off with a lived experience. Uh, and to me, it's it's important because it seems to be something that I cannot get rid of. So it seems to be part of me. Uh, so that could be one explanation or one answer as to why it's important. But I think I've pondered this uh, thing over the years and I think maybe it has to do with myth as being something that comes or something that speaks both from and with and to a sort of pre perfected being in the world. Um, not that we have to be non-reflective at all, but in order to be, you know, to reflect, you have to have something to reflect upon. And that is something that always precedes the reflection process or the reflecting process. And I think Mythos addresses this be reflective cogito or what you call it, mm. uh, of, of being in the world and with the world and, and maybe and being the world also. Uh, I think that, that could be like a tentative answer perhaps. Mm -hmm. Right. And yet it's not the only approach that um, emphasizes uh, the the fact that, of course, uh, being philosophically healthy is not just being a logical machine, right? Um, for example, if we think of uh, Spinoza, right, the, the the philosopher, he had this idea that joy is uh, the the core emotion that sort of uh, uh, is the source of all other emotions, and and. This is a very embodied, right? Because we could say, well, what's what's the essence of a healthy body? Probably mm. joy, right? The, the joy of being alive. Um, phenomenology emphasizes also uh, embodiment as as pre um, reflexive, and and uh, there are other approaches. I mean, I myself through creolectics, I. I emphasize uh, the myth in a way of the creel, this uh, creative source of life that has been called many ways in different um, creation uh, narratives, and which is something that you know, like like the key in Oriental traditions or Tao, it's it's felt, right? It's an energy that you you feel, and then you might elaborate upon. So. So I would say that I understand your answer, but it's perhaps not enough, right? We we okay, we have one element. Yes. But since it's common to other approaches, true. Uh, you would have to give more arguments to to show to narrow the choice, right? Exactly, and it's um, and you're right. There is definitely like a, some commonalities with uh, with embodiment, a theory of uh, of phenomenology, and so on. And you could say that uh, something like art or or other things could as well address this pre effective being in the world. I think the thing about myth is that so when we think about our, our own stories, our own like the epic of our lives, um, which can be like they can be sometimes dull, they can be grand, they can be epic, they can be tragic, uh, even uh, comical sometimes. Uh, Myth is like the meta narrative. It's where you, if you reflect your 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 lived life in mythos, you anchor yourself in something that is way bigger than yourself. So, if for me, it's also a way of uh, trying to avoid like relapsing into some form of uh, of solipsism, but but definitely of connecting to to something that was there way before me historically. And something that is may maybe also there way before me existentially. Mm -hmm. uh, that this kind of like, and this is not something I can prove, or, or I don't have like evidence, but I have this maybe idea that, that myth is something that it, pre it precedes philosophy historically, but maybe also uh, existentially. It's something, it comes from a world that is like pre reflective again. Right. So I think I think it's this thing that it's it anchors us in something, in like age-old narratives that are old, yet they are forever young. It's like when you look into like, if you look at like at like myths, you have a lot of commonalities regarding symbols. 
One thing would be the symbol of the well, and you can find the well in like Arthurian legend, in old Babylonian sources, Norse Eddas, and so on. And that symbol always seems to be something connecting us to something that predates us, something that precedes us. Uh, it seems old, and yet something leaps out of there from way back when and seems forever young, uh, which is very interesting for me. And you mentioned mm. the thing, this thing about feeling alive, the joy. And that's what comes to me when, when I work with myths. It's, it's the feeling of being alive and that it lives in you. Um, and then again, this could just be me. This could just be my you know, uh, individual experience. Um, I'm not sure. I can't say if this would be for everyone, but I think it is for many, though. Right. I mean, history shows that you're not the first, right? So you're not, you can't be accused of solipsism. Yeah. I like your sort of mise en abyme of the well, because it's in a way here, I think the uh, we see how you articulate myth and philosophy, right? Because you have this story, of course, of the, the fountain of youth. But if if you if you see that philosophically, it's the capacity to see things as ciphers, right? Mm -hmm. uh, therefore, uh, their capacity to to encompass new or refreshed meanings uh, every time. Actually, I suppose that there is this dialectic in what you do that I suppose you're not telling people heavily, oh, this is the symbol for this, this is... A, mm -hmm. Right, it's it's there. I think there's more uh, creativity in in that, uh, in the capacity for for things to whisper beyond themselves. Yes, yes. It's one thing that I'm usually a bit like hesitant about is to narrow down symbols to some you know category to say that oh, you have the well, it's the symbol of this or that that would be the way we treat like a concept relating to a thing. Uh, like the usual uh, a modern way of relating to semantics. So you have, if you said, uh, Mass, can you uh, turn up your volume of your, of your microphone? Then you would be referring to something that I can instrumentally use. And, and it's, it's quite obvious that it refers to, to this microphone and nothing else. Whereas the simple is much more open and not something to, so again, Perhaps we need to have like dictionaries of symbols, but I'm kind of skeptical uh, right. of them, uh, precisely for the reason that you mentioned. Right. Yes, and and also because um, it sort of um, participates in the analytic view of the world, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, according to which the world is is just a sort of a, a gigantic machine with. Par parts that could be defined and yeah. uh, and so i think that uh one thing that we share in common is is uh, a sympathy for the idea of process the idea of um, reality as a as a flow um which leads me to discussing something that's rather interesting for me i don't know if it's interesting for the others but you know um it's it's the idea so uh, I call Creel with a so it's the real with a C this uh, uh, primal prime mover uh, which is basically a, a flow of infinite possibility right and and this is is shared by um, many uh, process philosophers like Whitehead Bergson or Deleuze hmm. but um, in short. Uh, I was writing this uh, novel many years ago in French, which was translated in English about the metaverse. And the, the characters, they could access a dimension, uh, which was not the digital dimension, of course, which was rather the virus they were introducing to bring back people to authenticity. And in the beginning in the novel, I call it the real real, right? Very platonic. But I found that there was something wrong about that. And in the way I, I felt it was something wrong was really intuitive, right? It sounded a little bit like you're trying to start a car that doesn't start, real, real, right? Yes. And then I remembered uh, how Deleuze in his book about Nietzsche 
differentiates the active human from the reactive one, right? Yeah. The importance of action, uh, and led me to just put a C in, in front of the real, the C of creation. So it's it's actually a creel, and it's not uh, a reified. It's not a thing, right? Yeah. Uh, real. So later. Uh, I decided to take this seriously. So it started as a narrative. It started in in a sort of a fiction uh, text, in, in sort of a contemporary myth or micro myth, if you want. And and I decided to take it seriously, right? So slowly, I philosophized it. Nevertheless, there are moments where my uh, you know, my mythical uh, mind compares it with the with the Grail, and actually the uh, the sound is not so far right. Creel Grail, yeah. uh, and I would like to discuss that because you you probably know more about this than me. But um, isn't isn't that a very good example of how the Grail? which can be uh, defined in dictionaries as this uh, cup and uh, but in in fact is a symbol for the uh, for life for the capacity of life to constantly recreate infinitely regenerate yes, the, the grail is a very interesting topic and it's um it definitely has this quality of something that is very hard to get a grip of like just if you look at like the different legends it's hard to find it but it's it's also hard to conceive it. It seems to change also throughout the different stories, and it's related both to something that's kind of fleeting. So it, it was introduced uh, in the in the Arthurian legends by um, by Chrétien de Troyes. So around eleven, the end of the of the eleven hundreds, and um, he never finished his story about Percival, the the original Grail Knight. He died before he could uh, he could finish it. And that actually resulted in a very interesting story where you didn't get all the, there's a lot of like openings and open-ended answers there or, or questions. And um, the grail is something that appears at a castle of, the, of a so-called Fisher King. And Percival kept, kept, uh, comes in there, he, he sits with the lord of the castle. And then like in this grail, great hall, it's lighted with candles, you have, so first you have some, I think it's some young boys. They come in carrying some uh, candles. I'm not quite sure, just from if my memory uh, tricks me now. I, I think that's what comes first. It's the candles that are carried through the room. There's also a spear that uh, drips blood, like it comes out of the of of, of the of the end of the spear, the spearhead, um, and it's carried past them and then disappears, and then. There comes this dish, so originally the grail is like a dish. And it's carried like, and you can almost sense it when you read it, like it comes through it like in slow motion and he, he, he watches it as it passes them. So it comes from out one open door, it closes, passes by them. <laughs> it goes into another room and the door closes. And there's one thing he's desperate to ask, whom does it serve? Whom does this grail serve? But he doesn't. Uh, but he should have. We we learn that later on. That if he had asked that question, the king, the Fisher king, who is actually mostly wounded, would have been healed. He would have been able to uh, reign his country in a good way. Instead, now everything falls apart. Right. Because he didn't ask the question. So there you have also the philosophical aspect. But this thing, this fleeting thing that goes into the other room, and then the next morning he goes to bed. Ah, well, I'm going to, to ask everybody when I wake up, what was it? What was that grail? And then they're all gone. <laughs> mm. and, and, and there's no one to ask. So he right. he he misses the kairos, the moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He didn't grab him by the hair, right? Exactly. Mm. That's a no, that's a beautiful uh, story. At the same time, when I hear you, I was uh, thinking, well, is it philosophical to ask a question that you've been asked to ask? That's interesting. And he actually doesn't know that he needs to ask it. He only finds out later. Okay. Um, 
it actually starts out with him being a very young boy who is definitely supposed to not be a knight because his his mother is afraid of that because I think he lost some relatives uh, to like during knighthood and she sees some knight in the books and he doesn't know what they are. He thinks they are demons at first and then, oh, you're angels. Oh, yeah, you're God. And, um, and these knights want to ask him something and he just can't listen to what they're saying. Hmm. So he keeps asking questions, but he's not listening. And then later on, He's, he starts listening, but he stops asking. Mm. So it's very interesting. So there is a, a very interesting development. And then all of a sudden, the author dies. He doesn't complete the story. And you have the whole European knighthood watching like, what? It, it, this can't be the ending. And then within like 25 years, you have like hundreds of continuations and so on. Mm. And it, that's interesting because you can, you can almost witness historically this uh, mytho-philosophical, process-philosophical like explosion of poesis of, uh, of creativity power that, that you see in, in this uh, in the Grail legend right yeah and we could talk about the importance of deep listening and philosophical health but here I want to um, uh, genuinely um, point um, another aspect uh, which you was in your um narrative there is so the womb does it serve this is very interesting because if you if you accept at least for for a while my analogy with between the creel and the grail and so the idea that that the universe is um continuous creation right we yeah. can find in many myths okay and in fact very often i'm not the first one to ask this question is like well if the core of the universe is this creative explosion in all directions, whom does it serve, right? It yes. seems to be totally random and, and even Darwin say, well, it's sort of, you, you get to be lucky sometimes, but in other people more serious, like the alchemists, for example, it's a, they feel, uh, or in may, even more new age versions of it today, they feel, well, there must be a way to dialogue with this creative flow such that uh, it can help us. Yes. Right? So that question, I think this is how I interpret it. Uh, I don't yes. know you, what you would like to uh, say about that. Yeah, I think there is so much to say about this, this like, you know, this complex of, complex of symbols and ideas and I definitely see a parallel with the um, with the creel as, as as you conceive of it, and it's interesting. You have this explosion of of creative force or power in all directions, uh, which of course makes it difficult to get an answer as to whom does it serve or in which direction does it go, and can can we really know that? Um, so one angle to uh, from which we could look at it would be to say maybe the question is the interesting part and not the answer. Not that the answer is irrelevant, but that may, might be something that is always like moving further into horizon. So you, you, you get something, you get closer to something, but not quite there. Um, there is actually an interesting, if you take like the Grail legend, so you have Christian Detroit in the uh, late uh, 1100s, and then you have like a, a big compilation by a, a British knight, uh, Sir Thomas Mallory, in the end of the 14, uh, 1400s, uh, Le Mort d'Ature, he's actually writing it in English, but he's giving it like a French title, uh, The Death of Arthur. And there you have two knights who are also brothers, Sir Ector and Sir Lancelot. They're sleeping and they're dreaming that because they are not worthy, they will never attain the grail. Whereupon they both wake up and they look at each other. And then they say, go we seek that we shall not find. That is, let us go and search for the thing that we shall not find. So they know they're not going to find it, but they're still going to search for it, mm. which I think is just beautiful. Right. And there is something there, and even like a sort of also a, a, revel, a reverence that you don't try to grab it. Mm. Um, but you keep a sort of distance that actually makes you come closer to reality uh, about the grail. Mm. And again, a typical trope relating to the grail I think especially it's the German knight, Wolfgang von Eschenbach, uh, who writes that the, that the grail cannot be 
fought for. You can win it by fighting. And you can choose it or choose to find it. It chooses you if you are worth it. Hmm. Uh, which I think is very, and then the question is, how do you become worthy, of course? Um, right. So, so there is something active that you are co creating, um, but may, maybe not uh, the way we usually think about ourselves. So I go about and I do, and I mess, I'm this individual who does this. Uh, maybe there, maybe it's the process of reality doing things, and I'm like a, an actor, but I'm, but I'm not the movie. Um, I'm not sure if I'm sidetracking here, but mm. got carried away. No, but that's, I mean, in a way, uh, it's almost the definition of purpose, right? Let us search for this, only this that we cannot find. Yeah. Because if we can, if we can find, then it's not absolute. Yeah, exactly. Right. I wanted to um, digress a bit to uh, Greek mythology. Yes. Because I think there is another important uh, bridge uh, with uh, between philosophy and myth and True. even philosophical health. Uh, so in the sense that um, the Greek uh, concept of theoria and, and, and theosis or apotheosis. Mm -hmm. So that's another thing that I'm uh, interested in is this idea that um the greeks had I, before uh the art the greek orthodox the the um the christian orthodox that it was possible through in our lives to become like god to to become divine right yes and that was uh, it's actually came i mean it, perhaps previously it had other uh cultural origins but the philosophers were were from Plato and, and Plotinus. And uh, so uh, the uh, then the Greek Orthodox called it theosis and, and uh, this idea that, well, we don't have to wait for a, a realm beyond death to um, achieve um, divine uh, perfection. Uh, and so how does that... Uh, resonate in in the myth and and i think i think isn't this what this um the the the, the quest for the grail also in encompasses it right it's not mm -hmm. as it's sometimes defined a tale of greed right uh it, mm -hmm. but rather uh, a tale of trying to get as closer as possible to the divine while being embodied and i think that's why it becomes later uh connected with jesus christ because jesus christ is this idea of a god a, a human made god right or yes. god made human whatever you want to take it you know uh, so what's um how does that relate to to greek mythology uh or or to what what were in other ways? I mean, you can react on what I just said, but the, like another question uh, in that is the relationship for the Asian Greeks between mythology and and philosophy. Mm. Yeah, so it, it's inter It's definitely true that I think actually, if you look like at Greek orthodoxy, and then there is this apotheosis and theosis concept. There is something kind of like that, I believe. In Catholicism, but I, I guess it's more pronounced in Orthodoxy. Uh, the little that I know about it, though, but it's it's true that that you have a lot of, of like ancient uh, Neoplatonism and so on, like spilling over into Orthodoxy and also, of course, uh, early Catholicism. And and if you look at like Neoplatonism, then today, when we think back on Greek philosophy, the uh, we tend to think, and also I did that when I had my during my campus years. I thought of Aristotle, and Plato, and Plotinus, and so on as as people who had like a, a theory in a more like modern sense about the world. And and then you can go about and look at their their writings and see if they contradict themselves and so on. Um, maybe that's not an entirely justified reading of them. Uh, I think it was Pierre Hadot, so the historian of philosophy. Uh, 
who dig quite deeply into this question and said that, well, that wasn't really what philosophy was like in the ancient world. It was mostly a practice, then accompanied by a theory that was kind of like a support, but not something that was conceived of as something that was uh, to be to stand on its own, uh, which is often how we treat it, um, which is quite interesting. Uh, and if you look at them, they live kind of like in these philosophical communities that were actually kind of like the model for the later monasteries, Christian monasteries, uh, where they had spiritual exercises, uh, like meditations and so on, uh, philosophical walk and talks and, uh, and whatnot. And so it is something that had, had to do with the transformation of humans in this life. Uh, but also, of course, maybe preparing for for death that, of course, famously is, is a definition from uh, from the Phaedo uh, by Socrates. He, de he defines philosophy as melete tanatal, as a, 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 a preparing for death or a death contemplation upon death or death's meditation, something like that. Um, and then again, you could ask, so, so what is death? If, if like the deepest level of reality is like this flux, then that means that something is created and disappears all the time. So there's death all the time. So if we are transformed, we kind of die and are reborn. Mm. So, so in that way, I definitely see it as, as something like a... I, 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 that's why I think of, of, I came up with this idea that maybe this working in the cross field between Mythos and Logos is kind of like a... Or could be maybe like a transformative uh, taumaturgy. So like uh, where we are brought back to the wonder that is the world which transforms us. Mm. Um, and there, of course, speaking of Greek philosophy and mythology. So again, both historically and maybe also existentially, there is actually a link between philosophy and mythology that is mentioned both by Plato and Aristotle. So famously, and now you, you mentioned uh, Whitehead uh, earlier on, he, he, has a, he has a famous saying from, uh, I think it's Modes of Thought, where he says, and he's elaborating on Plato and Aristotle here, where he says, philosophy begins in wonder. And at the end, when philosophic thought has done its best, the wonder remains. Right. So there's some, something like the grail remains untouched. And what he's alluding to is, I guess, mostly it's the dialogue, uh, Theaetetus, by Plato, where they try to, to get to this idea, what is knowledge? And how do we know that we have it? And... Uh, the metaphysics of Aristotle, where they both claim that the philosophy, and not like a philosophy, but the act of philosophizing, begins in wonder, or the 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 state of wonder, uh, which in Greek is taumasign. And that concept has a prehistory in the Homeric list literature. So the Iliad, the Odyssey, and all the Homeric hymns, so the hymns to Apollo, Dionysus, and uh, Demeter, and so on. And it usually has to do with the encounter of humans with the other. It could be the divine. Oftentimes, oftentimes it's the divine, often, which is often like veiled or in disguise. So we tend to not see it. It can be the recognition of someone that we know but have forgotten or haven't seen for a long time, like Odysseus returning to Ithaca and being recognized because he has like a fall. It's, I think it's a small scar on his ankle. And he's getting recognized. And it's described as a mega tauma, a mega sema. That means uh, a, a great symbol, a great wonder. So you have this combination, actually, you have this idea of tauma sign and the tauma, the wonder, as something that connects philosophy and mythology. Hmm. Um, and again, in the Titus, uh so Plato, or it's, it's Socrates actually, of course, in the dialogue, he, he says to this young, uh, uh, this young fellow that he is dialoguing with, Theaetetus, after whom the, the dialogue is, is, is named, and he, is, he tries to calm him, calm him down a bit because he's getting frustrated, because now they found they, he thinks they, they they found the definition of knowledge, and then Socrates tears it all apart and says, yeah, well, I'm not really sure that holds that uh, that's watertight either, and then Theaetetus says, well. We are like in Aporia again, so in this, you know, bewilderment. And we're just back to Talmasa. And now I don't know where we are. And then Socrates says, well, you shouldn't be so sad about that because that's where, where philosophy begins. 
And then he says, and that's why probably that the guy who said that that Chalmers had Iris as a daughter wasn't far off. And he's alluding to the poet Hesiod, who famously wrote the uh, Theogony, the, uh, the Genesis of the Gods, where where Chalmers is is uh, is the god. That's a, actually it's, it's a god of the sea, whose name is derived from Chalmer, meaning wonder. And he has one daughter, which is Iris, uh, and that's speaking of like the bridge that you mentioned. There's a rainbow bridge between the heaven and earth. And he's also the father of the harpies, which are like fearsome uh, female bird-like demons that comes and tears a lot of your reality. Quite Interesting true. that it's it is it's the it's a god of the sea, right? Here we have the biggest flow. Um, yeah, I'm going to sort of because we we got a lot of wonderful information here. I just want a bit of comic relief, but about that idea of wonder, I'm just going to share a very short video with uh, you. Just had, uh, just, oh, that's weird. Just had that little feeling. You ever get that funny little, that kind of feeling, that vuja day? You know, not deja vu. This is vuja day. This is the strange feeling that somehow none of this has ever happened before. And then it's gone, you know? Right. So that was George Carlin here, but it's interesting because it comes back right this idea of uh, uh wonder for descartes uh, the uh, the core uh, emotion was admiration hmm. and indeed this capacity to to see the sublime not only when it manifests of course as something uh, radically other but in what is uh, also familiar right yeah. and of course the myth uh, and that's why some people might find it difficult to transcribe into our everyday life. It, it's because the myth mm. often talks about the other and there are non-familiar guys, right? Yeah. Whether it's the, uh, the monster, the dragon, um, what have you. Uh, and then with philosophy, perhaps, uh, sometimes philosophy is considered sobering, but in fact, yeah. they're even more intoxicated. Because they yeah. can look at this glass of water and be like, "Oh my God, this is this yeah. is totally out of uh, uh, the uh, the expected." So people might wonder then, how do how do we practice? How does myth? And I like your idea, by the way, of the constant dialectic between uh, the analysis and and uh, the symbol or the metaphor. And in a way, that was practiced by all religious schools, right? I mean, the scholastics, medieval scholastics, or there are some uh, Hinduist uh, texts that are extremely analytic. Uh, and uh, so, but people might wonder, okay, so how can it help me with my uh, dilemma that, uh, you know, uh, for example, uh, I, I was talking with a, a consulee uh, not so long ago, and and she started as an entrepreneur to help people, but she is horrified by the idea of having to advertise, right? Because yeah. it's not beautiful, right? Yes. And so, okay, how, how could myth help her in particular or, or all the people who feel that they have very uh, domestic uh, dilemmas? Yeah. Yeah, and, and I think so. So you're onto something. There's a how, how does this spill into practice in our everyday lives, and and also since myth seems to be something quite out there, you you need extraordinary entities in myth, and then we and here we are uh, with our ordinary lives. How how do those two things relate to each other? And I think actually the maybe the art of it is that perhaps the ordinary isn't as ordinary as we think. That is meeting up with my wife and she telling me something about her day at work might seem quite ordinary. But is it really? Is it really? Am I, am I listening to what she's really saying? She may be talking about some frustration, something that was interesting, exciting, but 
One thing is what she's saying. What does it mean? And where does it come from? So what speaks through her? That is interesting. And I think if you start to listen to reality in that way, then you start to see the mythical part of it. But to if you have to be like very like specific or practical, then what I have been doing for the past couple of years is I've conducted some like a couple of series of uh, mythophilosophical practice sessions in for smaller groups, and we've done so with, online together with a, I've done so with a with a partner of mine, and what we do they usually take uh, for two hours, two hours uh, uh, in total, and we'll have like a concept of the day. So it could be something like trust or friendship, or it could be uh, this year it's been the four cardinal virtues. So, you know, temperance, prudence, uh, fortitude, and, uh, uh, and so on. And, and what we do is we start with a myth. So we pick a mythical narrative, or maybe a, a couple of them, and then we dive into it, usually just on part of it. We read, read through it and we look for, in part, things that seem to have to do with the concept that we're discussing. So uh, one thing would be if we say like friendship. Uh, so in relation to that, we use the old uh, uh, Babylonian epic of Gilgamesh, who's like a king, a very bad king, at least at first, who then met some very, very, some beastly uh, being from out in the wild who is supposed to be his uh, opponent and then becomes his friend. And then we go very slowly through it. So we storytell it. And then we take pauses throughout. And we look for examples of friendship and like antagonism and so on. But also we look for things that just seems to, to get into our minds, something that seems important, even though we might not know why. So there might be something in the background that seems interesting. And then what we do next is we try to relate how we, if there's something here that we can see or find or have experience in our own lives. We take a small break, then we one hour through, we go into the second part and we go at it at a more philosophical way. So now we talk concepts. So what, what is friendship? What does it mean? Uh, what is the etymology of the word? What's the opposite of it? Um, what would be famous occasions of uh, friendship? Uh, what can be difficulties of friendship and so on? So in that way, you actually, you start with something that is with the myth and the symbolic narrative language. And then you, you make it impact you, not just as an individual, but as a small group. And you find out how is this important? So it, I'm, I'm mentioning this because sometimes it's hard to say like in theory, how do we do it? But when you do it in practice, then you start to see how, how it works. And, and I think like in my own individual life, I've probably been doing this for years, but it is something else doing it with other people. Um, yeah. Right. Indeed. The, um, the singular, right. And um, this is in a way what uh, the quest is about the singularity. Yeah. Uh, not in the, transhumanist sense uh, but in the sense of uniqueness yes. and yet of course because that the opposites are always there together when we find that uniqueness of who we are or the other person is then we realize the oneness right that we are all speaking you said about the conversation with the wife what is speaking uh through her right mm -hmm. so the um the clamor of 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 the one and and the multiple that dance because I think that's the original myth, uh, the the dance of the one and the multiple, mm. and and that dance being generated by the fact that they are actually the same, because pure multiplicity has at one point it's it's one, yeah. right? There are no two pure multiplicities. In, and so there is a an inner tension from the multiple towards the one. And at the same time, the uh, the one is constituted by that uh, yeah. diversity and therefore aspires to it. So, and that is, I think, the uh, the original myth, which therefore I think it's very 
philosophical in a way. So we could reverse provocatively what you said. And yeah. Before myth, there is philosophy through yes. that myth of the one and the multiple. And then it can take many forms. Yeah. Um, but but I agree with you that um, what is beautiful in, in the process of, of helping people self-innovate is whether it's through philosophical counseling or, or um, through myth, myth of philosophy, which is very close, uh, different perspective. But uh, I think what we're trying to, to allow them is is not to be an object right yes yeah and, and you were talking about um the um the everyday life and i i was looking at my glass and i was just uh, imagining a new myth or maybe it, it exists but i was seeing this glass and then this this uh this uh you know this box for glasses and i was seeing we usually see objects as, you know, inert, neutral, without emotions. But in fact, it could be that they are suffering so much beyond everything that we could ever imagine because they are made, they are interrupted in uh, what, to use a technical term, ipsity, right? Being a thing. Yeah. And we in our lives, capitalists, you know, sometimes very uh, normative, uh, rigid, bureaucratic lives, we're constantly, uh, there is constantly an attempt to make us things. And we do it to ourselves too, right? Mm -hmm. And we suffer because that's horrible to to be, it's like being petrified. There's a lot of myths of of petrification, right? Yes. And so what what the metaphor and, and, what I think also the connection with with the creative, the creative for all this tries to to reconnect us with this holy grail, which is simply the fact that we are becoming. Yeah, and we're not a thing. Yes, I think you're definitely onto something there, and it's um there is something about this process of philosophical dialogue that kind of frees up something that feels like it's trapped or imprisoned or something like that. And it's, um, so there is this interesting thing about, I think it was, it was Martin Buber, uh, the Austrian uh, Jewish philosopher, who talked about the difference between approaching either uh, like other uh, phenomena, could be people, could be things, as at that or at thou. And what he says is that, that well, yeah, you might not care about that because so I can approach something as that or as a thou. What's different is, is that to me, well, he says, the I that approaches something as a thou is actually not the same I or the same type of I that approaches something as a that. So when we like objectivize things or other people, we actually do it to ourselves in the pro- process. So this imprisoning of objects and people in like, you know, in rigid, uh, uh, fossil, petrified objects is also an imprisonment of ourselves. And when we start this philosophical dialogue, it maybe, or at least, it, it doesn't have to to make use of myth. I just think it's because I can't let the myth be, uh, or it won't le- leave me alone. When we use them, and I think you're you're definitely right. It is kind of like a dialectical process of going back and forth between the mythos and the logos part. Then you you get this. At the same time, you get more obscurity, but in a good way, and more clarity. So obscurity in a way, not where you get like a, a lot of concepts that is just merged together. You can't find out if it's salt or is this pepper and so on. But you get back to like this creative flow where, and I think if I remember correctly, the, the, uh, the word rhythm refers back to something like the wave in Greek. And um, so rhythm, and the wave is something different than the beat. Uh, the beat, so it, it starts here and it stops here. And you have this beat and you have this beat. Yeah, you could look at, at waves the same way. You have two waves. So there are two waves, but where do they separate? You can't say. So you, you get this connectedness or this flow feeling, which would be maybe obscurity 
from a very analytical, philosophical way of looking at things. At the same time, you get this clarity as to what is actually going on with me as a person. Um, what happens if I approach the world and, and people around me in a different way than I'm used to? It actually doesn't just do something for them, it does something for me. Um, and then famously, just one more uh, simple, you, you mentioned this thing about um, things uh, being petrified or, or entrapped. And uh, you also mentioned alchemy at one point. And then going back to the Grail, so uh, Wolfram von Eschenbach, the German knight of the 1200s, I already mentioned. So he makes his own uh, version of, of Percival called Parsifal, German, uh, much more detailed uh, than, than the original story. He does something to it. He does something to the Grail. Then instead of a dish, he makes it into a stone, actually, uh, called Lapsid Exilis. It sounds like Latin, but it isn't, which he probably knew. Uh, and I think that, that was definitely something he did on purpose. So you can, there's like multiple layers of, of, of ways you could interpret that name. Maybe something like a stone falling from heaven or something like that. Um, but the interesting thing is the way he describes this grail stone is that it is where all the knights get their food, all that uh, the beverages. So it's kind of like it is something that generates life. It is also said that the grail or the grail stone is that power by which the phoenix periodically perishes in flames and then rises again. And if you look closely at his concept of this grail stone, it seems very close to the philosopher's stone of alchemy, which is a actually not a stone, but a liquid or a powder, a substance. So you have a, the grail, which means a dish or a cup, that's not a dish, but a stone that possibly alludes to something that's not a stone, but something fluid. And then you're back to the creel. And, and it's interesting here that you have this generative and regenerative force in the creel. Right. Yeah, which is very important. And uh, so what, what I hear also is uh, something that I, I might have shared with you before, the idea that, of course, we're not advocating um, re a renunciation uh, of the analytic form of thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the um, the tale of uh, Hansel and Gretel are very interesting to show that there are three forms of intelligence. Um, I shared an article I wrote about that, but very, yes. for those who are listening very shortly, we can say that, well, uh, let's assume that everybody knows the story, otherwise you can read it first, Hansel and Gretel. And in the first, when the parents abandoned them first, uh, they they come up with this idea of uh, leaving white uh, stones, um, pebbles uh, behind them, such that they can go back home. And that's analytic thinking, right? You, you separate the world into parts, and yeah. each part you know leads to a part you know. And the thing is that they go back home. They don't solve their problem at all because their parents are still uh, poor and in the mess and, and a little bit evil. So they get abandoned again. So analytic thinking only solves locally the problem, but yeah. not holistically. And so then uh, they are abandoned again. They couldn't get the stone, so they get breadcrumbs. You were talking about food, interestingly. Yeah. And of course, here we are in dialectic intelligence because for them those breadcrumbs were little stones. But for the birds, it's food. And yes. the food win the dialectic fight for meaning yeah. and eat by eating the uh, breadcrumbs. So they can't come back home, which sort of saves them, right? right? And then they embrace, instead of you know going trying to go back home, they say, okay, let's explore the forest. Uh, and, uh, and then I think they enter into creolectic intelligence, which is let's face the sublime, which scares us, but at the same time, there is there is a possibility there when other possibilities have been tried. And then, of course, they, they find the, the, uh, the, the house of abundance, right, with the oven in the middle. So that's the creel, that's the grail, that's yeah. the oven from, ev from which every form of life originates. And, of course, all that abundance uh, and richness. But there is a witch. Which, yeah. we, right, the, the last obstacle, but that which is only their fear, 
right? It's only their fear of, well, that very infinite power that might also consume them. Mm. And by throwing the uh, the witch into the oven, and basically they throw their fear into the oven, then they can uh, really uh, get back home. And, and then they solve their problem because they, uh, I think they bring uh, gold or, or, or whatever. I don't know the exact detail. But, um, and so I think this, this balance between analytic, dialectic, and creolectic thinking uh, is is a key that today, and that's why I like your approach, because today we are heavily disbalanced after 200 years of um, heavy emphasis or more than 200 on analytic intelligence, which is, we shouldn't throw away completely. Of course, it's 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 very useful. Uh, but all these three forms of intelligence, they take another coloration. They take, uh, if they are combined, right? And yeah. so, Perhaps to conclude, and I will let you conclude, I don't want to conclude myself, but I think that there is a um, there is a possibility for, for people to uh, hear in the myth the possibility for themselves to interpret their own life with more courage. You know, we're back to epic. That's the first word I used. And I want to finish with that, at least with me, is that we gain so much from uh, letting our fear aside at least a bit and, and, and seeing the epic, the grandiose dimension of life, which is not always reassuring. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, uh, there, there, is, there is a reward for the, the responsibility of, of embracing the the sublime yes yes i definitely follow that and and also yes uh, i would definitely not suggest i don't think it's possible either that we like regress to a a bronze age homeric type of uh, approach in the world i don't think that's possible because we are approaching like the homeric uh literature from our own like within our own hermeneutic circle um but it is something not going back in that way, but it's something like going underneath existence uh, through myth, and then at the same time, like elevating ourselves above and having this view from above that abstraction allows us to have. And abstraction, it it could be something and has often been something that is that kind of like leaves the world, um, and then it does what it does to the world. It, it it tends to destroy the world if we abstract ourselves from it, we become like estranged from it. And we act upon a world and ourselves and our life as something that's like an object to be used. Um, I think like reintegrating the more abstract way of thinking or logos in mythos, at least to me, is perhaps the way to go, at least uh, for me. I see a, a lot of value in that. And and this just pauses our conversation and doesn't end it. Um, I think I really want to, to follow what you do and we might collaborate um, in, uh, I think you're more into collective workshops, right? So we, we might one day discuss something. Thank you very much. I am, I'm going to pause the recording now.